I think what I'm going to do uh, in view of some of the questions uh, falling off is I'm going to bring my daughter in. Uh, Caroline is a uh, mental health professional with uh, a lot of years of experience. She's a certified trauma uh, professional. Uh, she runs her own consulting company, Poland Associates, uh, and has a YouTube channel and puts a lot of YouTube videos both in on YouTube and on her channel. I'm going to try to join her in here. Um, Um, that you can um, uh, go and look at. Um, there she is. Hello, Carolyn. Hi. Hi. I'm gonna I'm gonna start a sort of start us uh, uh, going here on the mental health side of it. And if we run out of those, I'm, I'm collecting some of the medical questions. So um, maybe the first to answer because you were one of the first to say this is that after this COVID-19 pandemic it's very likely we're going to face a second kind of pandemic. And this caught the attention of the media. And that is a pandemic of mental health issues. Can you just speak to that? Sure. So I think, you know, during this time of social distancing and social isolation, we're not engaging with the people, our, our friendships, our community, the way that we would, uh, you know, two months ago. And so because of that, one of the things that we know is that isolation is the fuel for depression. Um, so whether that is someone who has had depression before or uh, we're experiencing trauma right now, we're experiencing grief right now, we're experiencing uh, financial uh, insecurity, maybe with a lost job or being on furlough, you combine all of these issues together and act at first, we have to attend to those physical health things. Mm. Once that drops down, all of those issues that we have been, that has been mounting really, um, we'll, we'll have to deal with those at that point. Now, you mentioned a couple of words that I want to come back to, and that is um, grief. And you've mentioned before about burnout. Now, this could be true for a caretaker, um, but it also strikes me in my own field of medicine, also nursing, and probably in your field of mental health, we are uh, in, in the midst of such need and insufficient manpower, particularly in the mental health field or, or woman power. Uh, and so speak to, to these issues of, of grief and burnout. And, and we've got time, so you know, elaborate on it. Sure. So if someone who's listening to this really is interested in digging in a little bit more, uh, two resources that I want to point you to. Last week on my YouTube channel, which you can find going on to YouTube and just searching Poland and Associates, I did two separate videos totaling maybe 11 or 12 minutes. They're excellent. On, yes. Uh, yes. Right. On, on grief and really digging deep into what grief actually looks like. Um, and secondly, Brene Brown has a podcast and she just interviewed David Kessler, who oh. is one of the leading experts on grief in, in this country. And so that was um, an excellent resource as well. So two options for going and listening to it and taking in some of that information. But I think we, we naturally think of grief and loss as um, a death, right? And so yeah. we obviously would say that there's quite a bit of grief and loss across the country right now. But really, um, grief can look like so many different things. And so I think about the, the seniors, uh, whether high school or college, who just didn't get to finish out their time. That is a time of, of grief and loss because you lost your ability to have that closure time. And then the fear of... Um, the, the unknown. No, no job when they graduate. Yes, <laughs> right, right. What's going to happen with the economy? Um, and grief can look like that preschooler who just can't understand why they don't get to go to daycare or to see their friends anymore or to their favorite Sunday school class. Grief can look like losing a job. It can look like grieving the world as we used to know it, mm, right? So take 9-11, for example. There's grief, even if you were totally unconnected to someone who lost their life in 9-11. The world was very different pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And David Kessler talks quite a bit about this. And I think this is going to be one of those times as well where 
we do things differently. Um, again, taking that idea of do we shake hands or not, just the physical contact that we have. Right now, as soon as we walk outside our house, everything is a potential threat. And our brain is now creating this whole new neural network around everything except that which is in my house is a threat. And that's going to take a while to unlearn. And we don't know how much of that learning is going to remain. And so grief comes at every, every level. And so underneath anxiety and fear and the uncertain emotions that we're having, there's this current of grief that's going. And if we don't attend to grief, gr grief demands to be felt. And so it will pop up through other emotions, but we really want to get to what that, that root emotion is. And so for each of us, uh, we really want to attend to what is the grief that we are experiencing? What are we grieving? What have we lost in this? And we need to own that and sit with that. You know, um, it, it raises a question because I've heard you talk about this. I know you've studied it, read the literature on it. And that's this idea of resilience. I think there was even a popular book called Grit or something like that. C can you speak a little bit, maybe just some tips of what can people do and I don't know if they can be specific or general, whether you're a healthcare worker, uh, and I know you've uh, ended up working with healthcare workers and pastors. What, what can the helpers do to help themselves in terms of resilience? And what can the people at home do? Sure. So one thing that I want to mention uh, quickly right before we get to that, and I, I hope that this will normalize some of the reactions that you all are experiencing, whether you're a healthcare worker or just um, getting a little bit more activated and stressed by things that you're hearing in the news. So for each of us, this is a, a small scientific explanation. We have mirror neurons in the brain. And so when we are starting to hear a story of pain, of suffering, of wounding, of trauma, mm. what our brain does, even if we're not seeing that face to face, is we start to create the video. No. And so what happens is we actually start to encode what we're hearing as happening to us. Essentially, we're experiencing tiny flux of trauma ourselves. Mm. And so if you are struggling in this time, I, I want to normalize that, that um, just by viewing pieces of the news or hearing stories from other people, or certainly those of you on the, on the front lines or people helping profession, um, secondary stress it is a thing because of our mirror neurons and how our, our nervous system actually regulates. And so to be proactive, we really want to build up that resiliency regularly uh, so that we can protect ourselves from what is a very natural uh, thing that comes out of this cost of caregiving. How can, how can we do that? Yep. Uh, how yeah, so here are five basic strategies that, that we can use. And again, the 10 tips that you shared uh, earlier absolutely would all fall under this as well. So my first one is uh, maintaining connection with other people. Our nervous systems are designed to regulate and co-regulate off of other people. Hmm. And no man is an island. And so we need to see ourselves in this much bigger community-based um, process than just individually. That's a, a really that helps to inform our decision making, right? I'm willing to put myself in more discomfort because I know it will help the people around me. So it helps us in some ways to answer the why we're doing what we're doing. Once we have a why, uh, then we can survive. Viktor Frankl said, he who has a why can survive almost any means. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's wise advice uh, in a situation like this. So staying connected in relationship, even if it's just FaceTiming or setting up Zoom meetings. Yeah. Is important. Yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, maintaining healthy thought patterns. And this is something that I've talked quite a bit about but we know that the words that we choose to use really do significantly impact our mental health. And so we can really ratchet ourselves up into anxiety if we're talking to ourselves that this is intolerable, unsurvivable, miserable, terrible. Now, I want to put a disclaimer. There are things within this that really are horrible and 
uh, do feel unsurvivable in many ways. And so that's not what I'm talking about, but I talk, I'm talking about the discomfort of navigating the time at home and quarantine. Uh, we just want to be really careful with the words that we use, moving from all or nothing, always, never, all the time sort of language to a more realistic middle ground. So I've mentioned this before, but if you go on Google and just search for the thought record, that will be a really nice, helpful tool to help you walk through the process of challenging and changing your thoughts. Uh, my third tip for building resiliency is being very intentional about how we move and how we breathe. So one of the things that happens when we're in a situation like this, where almost everything feels like a threat, is we're more likely to kick off into fight or flight. That's our sympathetic nervous yeah. system. And so we have to be very intentional about bringing ourselves out of fight or flight into this more relaxed and regulated nervous system. Mm -hmm. And we do that in many ways by how we move and how we breathe. And that's why research supports mindfulness, meditation, mm -hmm. yoga, those sorts of practices, how faith fits into that for many people are all really important because, because of that. Exercise falls under that. Uh, so we want to move and breathe very intentionally. My fourth is to be, and this kind of ties in with that idea of mindfulness practices, is to be a very curious observer of you. Mm. And why I say that is we can't change what we don't know. And we can't set boundaries and healthy limits for ourselves if we're not observing ourselves. And so we really need to start by observing ourselves, our thoughts, our feelings, our reactions, and our body sensations. We need to be connected to all four of those. And through that, we can help uh, provide the appropriate intervention. Good point. Yeah. Okay. And then the fifth one is giving yourself that space to grieve and inviting other people into that grief process. So again, that kind of connects back to that idea of maintaining connection, but we need to be heard. And the things that we bear witness to need to be heard by someone else and held by someone else. That's part of how we insulate against secondary traumatic stress. Um, and so we need our grief stories to be heard by others and we need to give ourselves the permission to grieve and the grace that we can be human in the middle of this. And so to expect that we're not grieving is to expect that we're something other than human and we can't be more than human. So, so Caroline, you, you've spent um, all your adulthood thus far um, training as a professional in this, practicing in the field, doing research in, in this, um, went through training as a certified trauma professional. A lot of this will be new language uh, to people. Can you just mention again where they can go uh, to look at your videos? Because mm -hmm. I've looked at those. They're very helpful for my patients. Um, they're, sh they're pretty short and, and concise. So if you could just say what the topics are and where they can find them. Sure. So if you just go into the search bar in YouTube uh, and search Poland and Associates, you can find it there. Or if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook at Poland and Associates, I will be linking those there when I put out new videos. Um, and this coming week, I will be doing a series uh, maybe 20 minutes or so split up into a couple of videos on compassion fatigue and secondary mm -hmm. traumatic stress and some basic strategies, some of which we've talked about tonight to uh, help to protect against that. Or if you're there, uh, there is a, there is a way out. And so uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that in each of those videos. I also share other resources. Yeah, uh, your, your, your grief one has been very, um, well received. Um, let me just mention one other thing, because um, you do see uh, healthcare professionals, you do see pastors either in your mental health practice or in your consulting practice. I know you've reached out to them just to volunteer and, and support them. What are, what are their needs? I mean, we, we talk about our needs, but you know, how can we support the mental health professionals, our pastors, uh, et cetera? What do they Absolutely. need? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think I, I want to highlight that just because, you know, we would say that we got into the people pro helping professions that we're in because we felt deeply called to that, that we mm -hmm. knew that that was our purpose in life. But just because you feel called to that doesn't mean that you don't need to be supported in that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so whether that is just reaching out to different hospitals, um, I'm seeing some of our local hospitals 
uh, submitting an address that you can send uh, drawings and letters to, and that they're just covering the break rooms. Uh, and so, again, that, that goes back to shifting from me to we, that I am part of this bigger island, and all of us have a role in this, not just healthcare workers, yeah. not just those who are on the front lines. Yeah. And so something as simple as that, checking in with the people helpers in your life and just saying, you know, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Or, or how can I just hold this with you, even if you can't, you know, because you're bound by confidentiality, even if you can't share that. Um, if you're someone of faith offering to pray or send notes of encouragement, your favorite verse, something like that, um, I think is a fantastic way. And then reminding them that it's okay to struggle and they're not failing because they are struggling. And I think as healthcare workers or people helpers in general, we're the ones who are supposed to be helping other people, not asking for help. Mm -hmm. And there can be shame that people feel. Um, and so I reached out, like you said, to some local pastors. And part of my question was, how can I support you as you support other people? Mm -hmm. Because we all need a support Good. person, even Good. if we're on the front lines. All right, I'm gonna ask you two questions. One you can think about, because this came out of the blue. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to answer it yet, but. Uh, you probably read more books in a year than anybody I know. I think you did 300 books or something last um, year? 140. Okay. Okay. So two, <laughs> two years worth. It's three yes. Um, uh, think about what recommendation would you give for parents of a book to read to their kids, maybe, or for adults to read, either because um, it's an excellent book and we want to spend our time well, or because we could learn something that relates to that. So be thinking about that. But I want to pick up a word. I wrote it down because you've mentioned the word over and over again. And, and I suspect it's a very important word. And that word was connection. I think I know what it means. But tell me in the context of crisis, what connection is and why it's important. So connection might simply be looked at as my nervous system is regulating with your nervous system. Most people understand this in the, in the way of a parent and a new child, that skin to skin contact that um, they do immediately when that child is born. Uh, and while we don't necessarily do that as an adult, when I and my mirror neurons are looking at you and your mirror neurons, we can begin to co-regulate. And so having our affect be matched, our, our emotion, having our words be reflected back to us, those are all ways to, to connect. When someone isn't rushing in to fix the problem, but is willing to just sit and listen in the hard. The reality is that life is hard, even outside of a global pandemic. But when people rush to fix the hard, instead of just saying, I'm sorry, let me sit in the hard with you, fixing it rapidly is disconnection. Being willing to just yeah. say, I'm gonna sit with you and be present with you and allow you to co-regulate off of my nervous system, that is connection. That's, that's part of why people, um, can often enjoy sitting with a counselor. Not, not all of it feels good because we're challenging. Um, but part of that is that that counselor is going to be regulated and therefore um, our clients have the opportunity of regulating off of us. Oh, if, if you want something hard, be a dad who raises a daughter to become a mental health professional. <laughs> Find out all the things you did wrong. Okay, um, so uh, books. Um, yeah, I, I, some of our listeners have actually started putting up some uh, recommendations. Thank you for that, especially with the kids books. I know I know that's not what you're reading, but you may come across it in your practice. Any any books that you can mention that you think would be really good at a time like this? Sure. So some of these I've mentioned it, and for kids in general, um, I would suggest the Fred Rogers Center. Mm, um, yes. And they have some excellent resources. So you could find some resources there. Um, on my Facebook page, Poland and Associates, I just also linked um, for kids a pandemic journal. So it helps them to begin to identify some of the emotion that they might be experiencing in this while they also have some coloring sheets. And oh, I'm wonderful. a hero by staying home. And yeah. like that. So that's not reading, um, but I am posting resources uh, there. And I think- and, and, I've Sorry, also sorry that's at Poland and Associates. 
Yes. Or somewhere yep. else. Okay. Okay. Yeah. At Poland Associates. And I've also posted some podcast recommendations for adults and kids mm. during this time. So you have to scroll back a little bit for that. Um, the book Tear Soup for kids can be great for processing grief and loss. Um, but for adults, um, I, in my grief videos, I posted three book recommendations, David Kessler's book, Finding Meaning, which he would identify as the sixth stage of grief that after grief, we have to make meaning of it. Ah. And so it's, uh, it just came out in December, I think, uh, or November, and and that was an excellent read. Say um, the title. Say the title again one more time for everybody. Yeah, it's it's David Kessler's Finding Meaning. Okay. And then, uh, if you are someone of faith, Jerry Sitzer's A Grace Disguise right, is right. Um, an absolutely wonderful yes. uh, reference on grief and just processing what that is without rushing. Uh, forward in it and just yeah. kind of honoring that that process. Uh, the book Boundaries by Cloud and Townsend mm -hmm. is um, an excellent book on the idea of ownership and, and being a curious observer of yourself so that you can set those healthy boundaries and say yes and no intentionally. Uh, so those are some books right off the bat that that I can think of. But uh, if you're interested in that, reach out to me. And when I have a little bit more time to think, I will come up with many. All right. So we've got about a, a two minutes left. I, I just wanted, Caroline, thank you for taking the time to join us. I know you're trying to create content and uh, resources and trying to help people as, as all uh, mental health, uh, uh, nursing, physicians, et cetera, are trying to do. So do be supportive of those people. Um, if you have specific questions that we could use to provide content back to you, just direct message us so we know. Um, Caroline has all of these resources on her website, our YouTube channel, Poland and Associate. You have a website too. What's that one? Um, I'm building it. So okay. it's, it's not being out built. yet, but it will be PolandAndAssociates.com. <laughs> okay. Um, for kids, uh, remember the Fred Rogers Center. And then um, if you're looking for credible information, this is really important. The media is not your source. Uh, social media is not your source. They can point you to valuable things. But go to Mayo Clinic's website. I know that content. It's highly credible. CDC, WHO, and often um, perhaps in your own whatever profession you're in, your own professional societies have usually put information there. So uh, we have maybe 15 seconds. What one thing would you want to say to our listeners? Give grace to yourself. Remember that we haven't had to live in a pandemic before, and it's really easy to let that inner critic and the perfectionist parts of us tear ourselves down, which mm -hmm. will just increase anxiety and depression. So we don't have a rule book for living this way right now. We're building it and we're writing it as we go. So give grace for yourself when Good. it's clunky. It's hard. Good. Thank you. Okay, so the two main websites I want to point people to are Mayo Clinic, and Poland and Associates to get that content. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's wonderful to get these questions. It's wonderful to feel like we can give information that's helpful. Blessings to all of you and happy Easter. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.